So in Psalm 26, as we look at uh, this under the heading of stability in integrity. Stability in integrity. I wonder as you consider your own life, what it's like to live the Christian life, I wonder if you ever feel, can I, can I live the Christian life without being fake? Or sometimes, who am I kidding? Now we know that uh, we have uh, the accuser of the brethren, our enemy, our, adversity, our, our adversary, the, the devil, uh, would gladly cast us down and, uh, and we don't want to beat ourselves up. But we know in our own hearts, don't we, from time to time, am I really living the way a Christian should live? Can I please God if I don't even live up to my own standards? How can I please God? I don't even please me. Do you ever feel that way? Can you avoid compromise and corruption in this world? Can you keep a con consistent Christian life going when everything is in flux, everything seems to be in chaos, everything around us seems to be um, contingent and unsure, unsteady? We, we're just not, qu not quite sure what's going to come next, what's going to come this week. And can we live with any consistency in the Christian life? Well, here in um, Psalm 26, and I wasn't here, so we read Psalm 26. We didn't. Okay, let's read Psalm 26. All right, very good. Okay, well, that's good. Let's read it now. Okay, Psalm 26 then, where uh, this is a Psalm of David. This is a prayer to the Lord. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Prove me, O Lord, and try me. Test my heart and my mind, for your steadfast love is before my eyes and I walk in your faithfulness. I do not sit with men of falsehood, nor do I consort with hypocrites. I hate the assembly of evildoers, and I will not sit with the wicked. I wash my hands in innocence and go around your altar, O Lord, proclaiming thanksgiving aloud and telling all your wondrous deeds. O Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Do not sweep my soul away with sinners, nor my life with bloodthirsty men, in whose hands are evil devices, and whose right hands are full of bribes. But as for me, I shall walk in my integrity. Redeem me and be gracious to me, my foot stands on level ground in the great assembly. I will praise the Lord. I will bless the Lord. Amen. I want to look at this where you, you have David clearly in a situation where he's displaying integrity in adversity. That's the first point that we look at here. Integrity in adversity. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity, and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Prove me, O Lord, and try me. Test my heart and my mind, for your steadfast love is before my eyes, and I walk in your faithfulness. Now, one of the things that we understand from any, any reading of God's Word is that God is everywhere and God knows all things and God sees all things. He hears all things. Hebrews 4.13, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Proverbs 5 says, your ways are in full view of the Lord and he examines all your paths. Matthew 6.4, your father sees what is done in secret. Okay, so what Google satellite will not show up about your life, 
God knows. Okay? You know, what Alexa can't hear in your home, God hears. Okay? No one knows what I'm thinking, God does. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it altogether, O Lord. So we understand that God is supremely in the position of being able to, verse 2, prove us, try us, test us. Now, is that, is that what happens in our lives? Is there a test? I wonder if you were the kind of person at school, you know, is there a test? And you immediately go into a panic attack. I was not that kid in school. I was, it would be okay. Maybe you're not that kind of person. Maybe you're the, t you know, uh, oh, no, we've got a test. I need to stop everything and start revising and start studying. What, what, where, what lesson was it anyway? Are you that kind of person that gets an anxious just at the mention of the, the T word, testing? There's a test due. But God is testing you. He is looking at your life. He is considering your ways. Psalm 33, 18, Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him. Do you fear him? Are you a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? His eye is on you. He's watching you. God is looking for, in this case, David teaches us, integrity, even in adversity, even when things are going against us. 1 Peter 1, we as Christians are to rejoice in various trials, tests, so that the tested genuineness of your faith may result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You're being tested so that he can be glorified. Now, hang on a minute. Hang on, hang on a minute. I didn't like being tested when it was me who was glorified. I got an A. I got a gold star. I got a distinction. When I do it, I do it for my glory. Now you and I, we are being tested for his glory. Huh. Because the way we live our lives reflects on whether he is good or not. And that's what we communicate to the world, by the way we live. And so here, uh, David is, is crying out for vindication. That's his first word, isn't it? Vindicate me. Now, that is, um, vindication is the evidence of integrity. In other words, I've been tested and I've been found to be sound. That's, that's vindication. That one's public and private lives match up. That there's, there's no disparity between the two. There's no secret corruption. That, that when your motives and your methods are called into question, they align consistently with God's word and with your word, what you have promised, what you have committed yourself to, that they line up, that they agree. Now, this is a great Christian quality, integrity. It's not a word we use as much as we should, I don't think. But that's the question. Are you the same person in private as you are in public? Or are you a, a fair-weather Christian only? You know, you, 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 it's a performance that, that you go on and you do your thing. And one of the things, I don't know whether you follow, you know, celebrity news, but, you know, these, these performers, these actors, you know, they, they go on stage and they do their thing and then they come off stage and they're completely different people. You know, they seem like I'm on the top of the world. Like comedians, particularly, think of Robin Williams, people like that. He's a laugh a minute, big life and soul of the party, but actually inwardly dying, desperate, sad, depressed. Uh, it doesn't seem to fit. How, what, what are you, really? And integrity, said Billy Graham, means our outward life is consistent with our inner convictions. So it's a really good definition. Our outward life is consistent with our inner convictions. This is what we really believe, and this is the way we're living it out. F.B. Mayer said this, it's a longer quote, but stay with me. He said, the, in, um, the supreme test of goodness is in the smaller incidents 
of our character and practice. Not what we are when standing in the searchlight of public scrutiny, but when we reach the firelight of our homes. Hmm. Not what we are when some clarion call rings through the air, summoning us to fight for life and liberty, but our attitude when we're called to the sentry duty in the grey morning. When the watchfire is burning low. That's the test. It is impossible to be our best at the supreme moment if character is corroded and eaten into by daily inconsistency, unfaithfulness, and besetting sin. Yeah. In other words, we all imagine that should the heroic day come when we must be burned at the stake, I will do well in that hour. You will not do well in that hour unless in the hour when no one is watching and there are no applause and there is no limelight. If you're not consistent at that moment, you're not really going to be much use in the great moment. Huh? Now, all of us have found ourselves tested. And those who nearly failed included a man called Asaph. We read of his story in Psalm 73. It's famous. We go to it often. Where he says, when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. What did he say to himself? Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and washed my hands in innocence. Here's a man who he just looks at the world and the world is having a high old time. And me... It's just wall-to-wall -wall trouble. It's just pain every day. And why am I being good? In other words, his heart is tested. And he says, I, as for me, my feet had almost slipped. Have your feet almost slipped? You're looking in this world and you're just saying, it's not worth it to be a Christian. It's not worth it to live this way. It's not worth it to give up my times. All those things, Pastor, and the, the Word of God in Hebrews was, was commending that we should give ourselves, you know, to draw near, to hold fast, to stir up, you know. Why bother with any of that? I, there, where's the payoff? You get a better deal for living in this world. Well, we recognize the voice. <laughs> we know where that comes from. But do we find ourselves saying it to ourselves? So will you wait on the Lord? Will you wait on the Lord? The temptation for all of us un in adversity when it's not going our way is to turn back when it no longer suits us or when we think that nobody sees us. No one will judge us because... Well, in, in Psalm 15, we hear about this great commitment to integrity that is highly prized in the eyes of the Lord. God honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps an oath even when it hurts and does not change his mind. That's how the NIV puts it. Yeah who swears to his own hurt and changes not. That's my word. That's my commitment. And even if it doesn't suit me, even if it's not easy, that's my word nevertheless. And God honors that. He values that. That's integrity. And integrity, if you're going to have that kind of integrity, it requires trust. It, there's faith involved. It, 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 it's, a, it's a thing of faith. Why have integrity unless you believe? But you do believe, as David believes. I have walked in my integrity and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Why would anybody bother with integrity? It's hard work. Unless we believed in the Lord. Unless we believed that there is a hereafter. Unless we believed that there was a reward for the righteous. Unless we believed that God is watching. Unless we believed that God is, a, is one who blesses and rewards those who fear him and walk in his ways. And he sees. So unless we believed that, why would we do this? Why would we live this way? 
Integrity depends on whether you have someone worth trusting. And that's what this world wants to know. Do you have somebody worth believing in? And only your life will tell them yes or no. In the Lord, you do have someone worth trusting. So will you wait or will you waver? Will you wait on the Lord or will you waver in your trust of him? Your integrity needs faith. Hebrews 11, 6. He who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Do you believe that? He is, and he will help me. He will be found by me if I seek him. Do you believe it? The man of integrity clearly does. Psalm 27, 13. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord and be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Much of the Christian life is about waiting on the Lord. I hate waiting. Do you hate waiting? I hate waiting. But at least if I'm waiting on the Lord, I'm waiting for someone who's utterly and unfailingly faithful. And if I'm waiting on his promise, it will happen. For your steadfast love is before my eyes, and I walk in your faithfulness, said number three, verse three. For your steadfast love is before my eyes. What my eyes are focused on in the situations that are easy or difficult, whether they're good or whether they're bad, whether adversity is coming my way, whether there's all sorts of pressure, scrutiny, difficulty, opposition, pain, martyrdom, whatever is coming my way, on what will I focus my attention? Follow your heart? Really don't, <laughs> really don't. The answer, my yoga friend, is not found within. Yeah? It's not going to come out of you. Meditation, you, you can seek to find yourself. You know, let's all go to India and go find ourselves. You, you won't like what you find. Yeah. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. What does the psalmist say? Your steadfast love is before my eyes. I'm thinking about how God loves me. I'm thinking about how God has loved me. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and gave him to be the propitiation for our sins. That's how we know what love is. Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. That's where my focus is. It's simple, it's almost simplistic, but it's true, and that's where my eyes will be. I'm going to look on the love of God, and I'm going to wait on Him. To live with integrity, notice this, you rely not on your own character, but on God's. Notice that in there in verse 3. I walk in your faithfulness. I walk in your faithfulness. Christian, do you look at people and you say, Kurt, he is a paragon of virtue. Kurt is the main man. He's not only a deacon in our church, but he's respectable. He's decent. He's upright. He's so consistent. He's faithful. He's just got it together. The man is a spiritual machine. Look at him go. I wish I could be like him, but surely that will never happen. I can't possibly be as good as Kurt. Yeah? Do you ever do that with people? Do you ever sort of idolize them? And you just assume the man is a machine. I don't know how he does it. He's just so consistent. He's just so got it together. He's just, but me, I can't, you know. I used to think this way about one of my, someone in my family. You know, he used to get up at 5 a.m. and have his quiet time, go for a run, run for two miles, and then come back, eat his big bowls of healthy muesli, and then, you know, read his Bible, 
in Greek or something. And I, ah, well, I, you know, and I'm struggling to get out of bed at, you know, sort of 8.15. I was sort of wrestling with the duvet. You know, the leaden duvet appeal, you know. Oh, no, I can't do it. Uh, have you ever been there and you just think, I am a couch potato. This man is a machine. I can't be like that. And he used to meet with me. And then I realized, actually, it, my, my integrity doesn't depend upon my invincible character. I haven't got one. It depends upon his faithfulness. It's his character we're looking at. That's what enables you to live a life of integrity. Yeah, it's not that you were born this way. It's not just in your genes. It's not just the way you were brought up. It's about God and relying upon him. Integrity requires trust. He is faithful to all his promises, so you live consistently in the sight of God because you trust him. Psalm 33, 18, Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love. He loves me. I hope in him. I will walk in his ways. And even if it doesn't make sense right now, I'm going to continue walking in his ways because he is good. That's how people get to be people of integrity. So that's integrity in adversity. Even when it's going against you, what you see is what you get. There is no fake, there's no shame, there's no sham, there's no dodgy stuff in that person. He's just solid. He's dependably Christian. Integrity, even in adversity. Why? Because we believe in the steadfast love of God and his faithfulness. Amen. Amen. Second point is this. If you want stability in integrity... Uh, then um, it involves, secondly, losing one assembly and choosing another. Losing one assembly and choosing another. It's losing and choosing, isn't it? Verse 4. I do not sit with men of falsehood, nor do I consort with hypocrites, I hate the assembly of evildoers, and I will not sit with the wicked. I wash my hands in innocence, and I go round your altar, O Lord, proclaiming thanksgiving aloud and telling of all your wondrous deeds. O Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Do not sweep my soul away with sinners, nor my life with bloodthirsty men in whose hands are evil devices and whose right hands are full of bribes. This, the combined picture is that I do not dwell with or remain with, I do not come and go in the company of, I do not assemble or congregate with lying, fake, wicked, violent crooks. And you say, hey, no problem, you say. I, who wants to hang out with those guys? You do. Otherwise, this wouldn't be in the Bible. Yeah, that's why, that's why it's here. It's because you and I, we are tempted to find ourselves dwelling with, sitting with, remaining with, coming and going in the company of, assembling with, congregating with, being found with, taking our stand alongside these people and you say no problem who wants to hang out with those bad guys titus 3 just you remember who you are right <laughs> you remember where you were born right you remember how you grew up right you remember what it was like before jesus yeah bc before christ in your life do you not remember was it that long ago what were you, like six months old when you got saved? Can you not cast your mind back even just a little bit to think to yourself, that's not the way I was. Titus 3 says that before God's kindness saved us, we ourselves were once foolish, 
disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. That was us, not that long ago. Colossians 3, 7, you lived among them and you also used to walk in these ways. That's the truth of God's word and you know it to be true. Ephesians 2, 3, All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. So let's just stop right there, right now, of going, I don't understand these people. I think you do. You were one of them. You were one of them. Yeah. For pity's sake, you must have a gospel interest in the lost. For you were that person. That was you, but you were saved by the kindness of God. But nevertheless, let it not take away from the fact you were born in a crowd. You were one of them. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath, children of wrath. That's who we were. And so is it that alien to you to say, oh no, I would never hang out with those sorts of people. You were those people. Not so very long ago. But the grace and the kindness of our God has saved you. And so verse 9 tells us why separation is necessary. David pleads with the Lord, Do not sweep my soul away with sinners, nor my life with bloodthirsty men. Because lostness and death follow from being in the congregation of this world. If you want to assemble with this world, death is the end of that. If they are the ones we sit with, walk with, consort with, enjoy the company of, the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. This world, beloved, is a sinking ship. That's why online, in the chat room, on the social media page, in the book, in the magazine, on the box set, in the film, in the book you're reading. Are you immersed in this world? And is it what you love? This world, beloved, is a sinking ship. How do we get off this thing? That's what you should be thinking. (laughs) How do I get off this thing? I don't want to be with these people when the judgment comes. Encourage one another all the more as you see the day approaching. What's the day? The day of judgment. And if you will be found with the world, you will be lost with the world. Now we are the ecclesia. The word for church, the New Testament church, is an interesting word. It means ek, out of, Klesia, called, or kaleo, from called. So you are the called out ones of the church. It's in the name. It kind of says it on the tin. It's written on the label there. That's who we are, because we are called out people, called out of one congregation into another. Don't fall between the cracks. There are none. There's no fence to sit on here. It's not that you can leave one and not join another. You're called out of one assembly and you're put into another. You are out of one body, one kingdom, one domain, and you are put into, by the grace of God, in saving regeneration, into another kingdom, another body. Colossians 1.13 He, Christ, has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. You're out of one and you're into another. Or are you? Beloved, let me plead with you again. If you can't say, yes, I have been called and yes, I am and I do belong to the church of God, then what dreadful things the day holds for you.
whereas Psalm 1 gives meditation on the law of the Lord, on his law he meditates day and night, and he should be like a tree planted, but the, you know, the wicked are just going to be swept away like the chaff, you know. It's the meditation on the law of the Lord is that which will uh, remove us. I, I, I don't want to stand. I don't want to walk. I don't want to stand. I don't, I don't want to sit in the seat of the scoffers. I, I don't want to be with those guys. But in his law, I meditate day and night. Okay? So while in Psalm 1, meditation of the law of the Lord is the antidote to worldliness, here, worship is. Here, worship is the antidote. Verse 6, I wash my hands in innocence and I go round your altar, O Lord, proclaiming thanksgiving aloud and telling all your wondrous deeds. O Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. And it is wondered at by some, I guess, who heard this morning's sermon, he's banging on about going to church. Mm -hmm. Yep. This is why. This is why. That you're in one body or the other. You're in one assembly or you're in the other. You're in the world or you're in the church. And there's no other place. This side of glory. You're in the world or you're in the church. Are you in this church with both feet? Or are you, are you sort of wishing you were kind of back in the world? Well, I guess we're all kind of tempted to be in the world. And you know what it's like? You filled your head. Maybe you've watched a film. Maybe you read a book. Maybe you listened to a song. Maybe you had a conversation with a non-Christian friend. And you come out and you, f you feel a bit slimed, you know? Feel a bit contaminated. You are shaking hands with somebody who you know is just filthy. <laughs> Have you ever done that? You're just shaking hands with somebody. They smell rank. They, you know, they, you know, they probably, you know... Or, you know, I see young men walking around with their hands down their trousers, you know, walking along like this, you know, and then they sh shake my hand. My hand feels like it's painted like something, and I, I, I don't want to touch it to my face or anything. I don't think, I'm not really a clean freak or a germaphobe or anything like that, but there are some people that you just think, okay, I've shaken your hand, I've shown you some kindness as a fellow decent human being. Now, where are the bathrooms? Yeah. Have you, are you like that? Do you know what that's like? Just me, no one's shaking my hand after the meeting. Right, okay. But, okay, but sometimes you feel like that. You feel like, I'm contaminated here. Some of our medical professionals will know what that is. Okay, I have, I've, I've crossed a boundary here. There's been touch between some contaminated. I need to, there's a protocol. I've got to go through some cleansing ritual now in order to be hygienic and safe, yeah? Let's hope so. You're trying to keep us alive, okay? But in this way, we've been in the world and we feel the contamination of it. And, and, and you know, I, I wonder if you feel slimed, just I, I'm contaminated now. I've been a bit polluted now. I need, I need to be clean. Do you understand what that's like? Well, he talks about here, verse 6, washing. That is preparation for worship. That is, that is recognizing the need of cleansing for acceptance. Do you? Do you? You're only in this body. You are accepted in the beloved. Jesus Christ. That a price needs to be paid in order for you to be cleansed, in order for you to belong here. And you do, because of Jesus. Do you go round the altar, that is, to come to God by means of the sacrifice he has provided for that cleansing? David, of course, writing in the Old Testament economy, where they were still pointing forward to the Messiah with the sacrificial lamb and offering. Yeah? 
We have the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no altar now. Notice in the architecture, there's no altar. When there is, well, it's blasphemous, really. There is no altar. There is no sacrifice today. The sacrifice has already happened. Yeah? You, you with me, Protestant people? You, 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 there is no sacrifice today, right? Okay, hallelujah. It's once for all paid. But when we come to worship, when we, when we yeah, when we, you know, clean the dirt off our feet, so to speak, and we come into the house of God, we do so by means of the sacrifice once made for us. Yes? Amen? Is that just me? No, it's not. It's you as well. It's you as well. And so we're proclaiming thanksgiving. We're telling. This is giving glory to the Lord with my heart and with my mouth when I'm in the people of God and I'm acting like the people of God and I'm loving God's house. Devotion. The continual practice of worship. Look at those things. This, this is what it means to be in the house of the Lord. That's what it means to leave the congregation of the world behind and say, look, I need to be cleansed because I feel a bit... Ugh. I feel a bit dirty because I've been in this world and now I come to the worship of God and I do that by the cleansing. I do that by the sacrifice once made. I do that by proclaiming in thanksgiving and glorifying my glorious God who has given me this life with my heart, with my mouth, with all my being. And I love God's house. So a question, and I'm preaching to the choir because you're here, right? I, I get that. So I don't want you to go away feeling, he bashed me again, and I was there. But I, no, I'm not. But by all means, take this recording and pass it on to someone who isn't. Where would you rather be than in the house of God? You got any place better to go? Anywhere? When you, look, when you say it like that, Pastor, thank you, because you're the guy who you always do say it like that. Thank you. <laughs> but it needs to be said. Where would you rather be than in the dwelling place of the Lord God? Are you loving God's house? What, what, is, what is habitation without habit? <laughs> what is habitation? Without habits, the clue is in the language, yeah? That's where I want to be. And the reward, folks, is God. The reward is God. It's God's dwelling place. To come to church, it's not like the reward is Pastor Ali shook my hand and he ticked his register to know that I was there. That's a very small reward. It's really not worth very much. To come to the house of God is to come, where, to come where God is. To come to the place where God is. And He is the reward. You don't get brownie points for turning up here. You get God. Because we're in the worship of the Lord. Stability. Thirdly, stability in Integrity. Verse 11, verse 11 and 12 with me. But as for me, but as for me, that's the kind of language that says people are doing different things. People are doing different things. Do you remember Peter saying to the Lord Jesus Christ after the resurrection and after he's been reinstated? He's so Peter, isn't he? He's just been reinstated. Okay, you're just loved and accepted again. And he says, now, Jesus, I've got a big theological question. What about John? Hmm? What about John? (laughs) I love Jesus and I love Peter. Peter's just so me. I see Peter and I think I would be that stupid. And he just says, what about John? What's going on with John? And Jesus says, message version, mind your own, Peter. Yeah? He just basically says, what's that got to do with you? Okay, and that's the issue, isn't it? That in, in this life, we can bang on so much. Please, you know, I, I, 
It's brief confession time, okay? Sorry about that. Uh, I did Twitter uh, for about, I don't know, six weeks or something like that. I did Twitter because I thought, yes, I owe it to the world to share my opinion with them. And here's what I learned. No one wants it. <laughs> and so I, it's purely an exercise in just venting my frustration with everything the way the world is. And, well, there's enough of that in the world. So pe funnily enough, people are not queuing up to hear that. And so I just wound it up. I just, okay, I, I, I don't want to do any more of that because comment on what other people are doing is, what use is that? What use is it really? It was an interesting experiment. I learned some stuff, but basically it's a waste of time. And as I did that, I recognized this. What concern is that of yours? What other people are doing? I think I know a lot of Christians, maybe you do too, who spend all their time judging other Christians. Those are the bad guys. These are the people that are bad. Now, in, in fairness, there's a role of shepherding. That, that, that is a duty of the shepherds. To Yep, you, you'll hear me. Name and shame. Prominent supposed Christians, professing Christian pastors, teachers, and saying they're doing it wrong. Why am I doing that? To guard you from them. But you don't need to do that. That's the good thing about having a shepherd. That'll, he'll do that. He'll do that. I mean, when do you see sheep organizing? Uh, we were on holiday a couple of weeks ago in a place where there's loads of sheep. Sheep, and they're mental animals, stupid, crazy animals. You know, they always run away on the road. There's a big field there, there's a big field there, but the way I'm going to run away is away on the road that the car is definitely going to go. I, go, I will run that way. Sheep. Crazy animals, right? Okay, But you never see sheep saying, you know what? We really ought to organize ourselves. Okay, We really ought to organize ourselves because this fence is down. Let's build it up again, guys, because it's for our own good. What you never see is sheep saying, let's organize, you know, because um, you know, there's, there's all sorts of uh, intestinal parasites around at the moment. Let's get ourselves a drench. Yeah, okay, let's just queue up and let's just... No, that's not the way sheep are. They have shepherds to do that for them. And it's kind of like that way. You know, they, they, the predators and the dangers that you face as sheep, you have shepherds. You have shepherds. So you don't need to take it to Joel Osteen. Leave, leave it to me and Kevin Christman. We'll, we'll sort him out. Yeah, we got him. You're good. You're good. Isn't it good to have shepherds? Oh, that's great. That's great. They will look out for the stuff that I need. That's wonderful. So relax, guys. You don't need to fix the planet. Whew, that's a weight off. Thanks, Pastor Ali. Well, you know, good. I need to fix the world. I have no idea how I got there, but that was, that, that, that was um, you know, that, that was good. I have no idea where, how I got to there. It's been a long week. But, oh yeah, yeah now, now I get it, right, okay, the connection. There was a connection at one point. My synapses are still connected, that's good. Okay, so, but as for me, and this is saying, look, it doesn't matter so much what other people are doing. That's not your great concern, to go fix the planet and sort everybody else out. As for me, David is basically saying, look, a lot of people don't think this way. But as for me, a lot of people don't really have an investment in the house of God. But as for me, a lot of people are still wallowing in this world and they're loving it. But as for me, and that's really all you've got. To, you, believe me, you know, Chloe is not going to give an account to Jesus about what Temsey has been doing with her life. It's as simple as that. Yeah, it's Chloe's deal to give account of her life before the Lord. And that's what Jesus said to Peter. He said, you know, why are you busy judging and worried about John? You get on with what I just told you to get on with. Oh, okay, okay Lord. <laughs> okay. Sometimes you need that little pep talk from Jesus, don't you? Just stop trying to fix everybody else. Just concentrate on the thing I told you to do. Right, oh, Lord. Yes, I'm on it. Okay. As for me, I shall walk in my integrity. Redeem me. 
and be gracious to me. My foot stands on level ground in the great assembly. I will bless the Lord. For a man of God, David mentions himself a lot in this psalm. If you go and look at the personal pronouns, there's loads of them. I, me, my, me, my, I. It's just I, 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 I. He's talking about himself an awful lot. And I guess that's what you would expect from the man who would become the house standard of righteousness for the, for the kings of Israel. He is the house standard. Read through 1 Kings, read through 1 Samuel, read through 1 Chronicles, you know, and you hear David, David, David. He didn't do as his father David had done. He didn't walk with wholehearted integrity like David, his father. It always goes back to David. David, David, David. David's the house standard. So I guess maybe he, he's got more right to talk about himself than maybe you or me. But it does seem to me that he could seem to be kind of boasting in this, I've got integrity. All the other guys are scumbags, but me, I'm going the right way. Look at me, Lord, in favor, because I'm great. And it, 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 do you ever read David's writings and think, oh, I'm not sure I would say that. That's a bit, uh, kind of seems a little boastful. Well, <clears throat> yeah, I have trouble with David in that regard, and I guess we'll talk. Maybe I'll be last in the queue to go see him, but when I do, I'm just going to say, Mm, two things. One, the kind of I am great psalms, and two, the imprecatory psalms. Talk me through what, what were you thinking exactly there, David? I need to, he I need to hear what you got. Anyway, that's going to be an intro. Let's leave that for heaven. All right? But look, here's the thing. We know he didn't walk in his integrity. Although he has resolved, I shall walk in my integrity, and that's admirable, and yes. David, you the man. I shall walk in my integrity, but he didn't, did he? And we all know it. The man known for his wholehearted devotion to God, let his heart be divided and let his guard come down. He was unfaithful to his wives and he sinned with Bathsheba and he killed her husband and he lied to his soldiers and he troubled his family and he dishonored his God. And it's written... Large, because the scripture is the truth. It's not fairy tales. Fairy tales don't do that. The heroes always get it right, don't they? But not, not, not in the truth. Because we know how he lived. No, but our, his resolve was not enough. And if you want to be a person of integrity, remember this. Resolve is not enough. He needed redemption. He needed a redeemer. And isn't that what he says? As for me, I shall walk in my integrity. Redeem me. Redeem me. And be gracious to me. He gets it after all. Aren't you so glad that God is a redeemer? Oh, hallelujah, he's a redeemer. He takes our brokenness, he takes our sin, he takes our shame, and he makes it his own, while all his perfect righteousness is freely transferred into our account, and he restores us with love and family and dignity and peace. What a saviour is Jesus Christ. Hallelujah for Jesus, our redeemer. God's Redeeming grace is our reason for his accepting us. <laughs> Do you get that? Sometimes we don't. Sometimes we think, I need to be a person of integrity. So don't go away from this sermon saying, I got beaten up again. Pastor Ali, yeah, she's giving me a hard one, just a difficult message, and it, I got to be a person of integrity. And I, I feel so pretty rubbish in that. No, don't go away thinking that. Think instead on your great Redeemer. God's redeeming grace is the reason He accepts us. He couldn't love anything in me were it not for His own redeeming grace. That's all the good in me that He ever sees. His redeeming grace. I owe all to God, my Savior. And if that's not what you believe, you're not, that's not Christianity. 
Do you understand that? That's some other works-based religion where you're trying to deserve God. You don't. You can't. You haven't. You will never. Praise God for redeeming grace. He has taken you when you didn't deserve his love and he's given it to you freely to make you pleasing to him. Oh, let me rave about my God, won't you? He is amazing. And I'm not amazed enough about this and you clearly are not because I didn't even get an amen. We have... um, completed another round of the biblical counseling course and it's been good to do that um you know kev kev was saying it's good to do it again good to be reminded of it again and that that it's true and we do this why do we do biblical counseling courses it's really simple really people have got problems (laughs) people have got problems you people have got problems i've got problems we we're surrounded by problems and the bible has the answers That's why we do the course, to teach us how to tell people what the Bible says to fix the problems that they face in their lives. Because people are chaotic and imbalanced and anxious and out of control and hopeless in their problems. And stability, keeping it together, is the need of the hour. It's the need of our generation. Don't you think? People are crazy out of control and they need help. They need stability, they need order, they need balance, they need to keep it together. How are they going to do that? Here's what the psalmist says, David says, verse 12, My foot stands on level ground. Level ground, how nice to be level, steady, stable, predictable. I've got this. No nasty surprises. No unexpected disasters. No slip. No slide. No crashing defeats. But safety, peace, balance, calm. Yes, I'm up for some of that. Give me some of that. No dramas. Just me doing life the way God's word says it should be and walking in the peace and the happiness of that. Matthew 7, 25, the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock of Christ Jesus' teaching. How nice it would be to stand on level ground. Where does my foot stand on level ground in this disordered and volatile world? On the word of God. No, that's, uh, okay, that's on. But where? In. <coughs> uh-uh. my, stand, my, my foot stands on level ground in the great assembly where I will bless the Lord. Okay. You want the world or the church? It's that simple, folks, because I'm losing some of you. And if you're listening to me on the if you're listening to me on digital means, you know, I've already lost you because you're not here. Hmm? But I need to say it perhaps even more simpler than I than I have been. Is it the world or the church? Which Because if you ain't in the church, you're somewhere else. And there's only one else place you can be. You're in the world. What you doing there? Christ died to redeem you from the world. Why are you there? Is it the world or the church this week? Let's bring it right down. This week. This week. What joy there is in the redemption that comes from Jesus Christ and in the level ground on which he makes us stand on his word in the great assembly. I want to be there. Do you want to be there? That's why I want to be there. I don't feel lonely. That's not why I tell people to come to church. You know, I'm, I, I have friends. We're good. <laughs> I don't need you. <laughs> I'm not lonely that way. But for you, for your benefit, for your advantage, 
for you to be satisfied in nothing less than God himself, I want you to be here. When the people of God are gathered in the worship of God, on the word of God, that you might stand on level ground enjoying the pleasures of your redemption in God by his grace. Does that sound like a good plan? Let's, let's do that. Let's, let's do that. Let's, yeah, give me some of that. Pastor, that does sound pretty good. Here from the world we turn. Jesus to seek. Here may his loving voice tenderly speak. Jesus, our dearest friend, while at thy feet we bend, O oh, let thy smile descend. Tis thee we seek. Amen and amen. Let's pray. Let's pray again. O oh God, give us Stability in integrity. Not so that we can tick off how many days till, uh, how many days since I last sinned. Uh, not so that I can look better than somebody else in the congregation. But so that I get you. Oh God, I thirst for you in a dry and weary land where there's no water. Uh, my, like the deer, I'm panting for thirst for you. Satisfy my soul in your presence, in your word, in your house, on your day, with your people, in the church and not in the world. It, when, when, when we use those words of one syllable, it does seem awfully simple. Not cheap. Oh, no, 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 purchased at great cost. Inestimable cost. But simple nevertheless. Are you in this assembly or that assembly? Are you seeking God or are you seeking the world? O oh Lord, with all my heart, I would say, Lord, cause me to seek your face. Cause me to be satisfied with nothing that this world might offer me, but your presence forever. Give us that grace. In Jesus' name. Amen.